Okay. Alrighty, um, so I'm gonna be speaking as well, but I'm also a moderator for this. So um, today, uh, Izzy Song, um, she's 14, she's gonna be presenting on rape culture. And then Ali and I, we are both part of the um, Safe Bay Planning Committee for the summit, and we're just gonna be helping her out along the way. Yeah, okay. So um, as uh, Alana said, this is a presentation about rape culture. Um, and yeah, let's just get started. All right. So please know that we'll be talking about very sensitive topics in this presentation. And um, we do encourage you to take a break if needed. Uh, if you feel the need to leave after seeing the warning, please feel safe to do so. This is a safe space, okay. So what is rape culture? Uh, okay, so we're just gonna jump right into it. Um, real quick, my name is Alana, um, I'm 16. Um, uh, Izzy's 14 and Ali is 17. So I think we're the only like all youth um, presentation. Um, anyways, so basically what is rape culture? So the textbook definition is that rape culture is a society or environment where, pe where people's social attitudes have the effect of normalizing or trivializing sexual abuse. Um, so just, I guess, in simpleton terms, it's basically kind of the stimuli that are constantly surrounding us, um, whether through media, um, conversations, jokes, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that kind of subconsciously influence the way we view sexual assault or rape. Um, and basically what strengthens or just makes rape culture what it is um, are rape jokes, dress codes, um, specifically targeting women. So like arguing that collar, like showing your collarbones um, is a distraction um, to learning. Um, gender roles that we just have like ingrained in our ingrained in our heads um, and what we think um, each gender is fit for doing in our society. Um, not educating children properly, properly about sex um, and consent um, and I mean everything, basically all the presentations that we've had at this summit, right? Those are all um, just not educating children properly. Um, victim blaming, locker room talk and then locker room abuse. This is a big thing with um, boys. Um, revenge porn, stalking, catcalling, um, like sexual harassment, uh, raiding people's bodies, believing in rape myths, um, more like groping, just sexual harassment and then non-consensually sharing other people's nudes. All right, so these are some of the things that we're gonna be talking about. Um, what can you do about rape culture? So number one is never blame the victim. It's very important to never blame the victim. Um, never say things like the person was asking for it or the person was drunk or that the person had said yes earlier. There's never an excuse to blame the victim and it's most definitely never their fault. Um, number two, don't normalize letting the issue go. Uh, common phrases that support this are such as boys will be boys and it'll happen all the time. Uh, rape is and should never be normal. It should never be normal. So saying things like this definitely contribute to rape culture and just, yeah, don't ever say it. Um, three. Uh, always try and teach people and yourself and future generations about consent. Uh, we have a future slide about um, this whole topic that goes a little bit more in depth. Uh, four, always, always cancel out rape jokes. Uh, rape, rape jokes are never funny and they just normalize sexual assault and just trivialize um, and just put down the, the victim's experience. Uh, five, redirect and change education. Instead of telling women to cover up and stay safe, teach men to be respectful and 
about toxic masculinity because there are many routes to rape and truly what needs to change is education. Um, so here are just some statistics about um, sexual assault um, and just things, yeah. So basically every 73 seconds an American is sexually assaulted, um, which is insane to think about. 53% um, of high school girls are assaulted by a peer. We'll get, we're gonna get into this in the next slide um, about rape myths, but I think a, a big myth is that um, in order to have quote unquote real rape, right? It has to be done by a stranger. Um, and that's just not true at all. Um, uh, and then 60% of high school boys find it acceptable to force themselves upon a girl in certain circumstances. Um, that should be 0%. Um, and that's quite disturbing. Um, one in two rape victims are under the age of 18. Um, teenagers are especially, teenagers, children in general, are especially vulnerable to sexual assault, um, which is, and I mean, that, that's really important to change because obviously we don't want anyone to be sexually assaulted, but um, as a child, um, that's really extremely um, difficult. 58% um, of 7th through 12th graders experience sexual harassment. So this is just groping, catcalling, um, lewd remarks, unsolicited um, dick pics, et cetera, et cetera. 81% um, of girls in foster care were sexually abused and 68% of those suffered abuse at the hands of multiple people. Um, more than half of child sex trafficking victims of 2013 were from foster care or group homes. Children of color have almost twice the risk of sexual assault than white children and LGBTQ plus victims are more vulnerable to medical professionals dismissing their identity or blaming them for making it up due to their identity. Um, we'll get into this a bit more on the next slide as well, but um, people of color and then people who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community are also um, like more vulnerable than say a white person or like a white man or a white woman. Um, so yeah, hopefully these statistics are shocking to you. And then we're just going to get into the myths. So unfortunately, um, just like fake news, um, myths um, are oftentimes, or no, are like actually much more believed than the facts. Um, and so I think that one of the biggest ones is that only women and girls can get assaulted. Obviously that's, that's not true. Um, uh, males are more likely to be sexually assaulted than accused of raping. So they're more likely to be sexually assaulted than um, being accused of, of like the argument that women false report um, rapes. Um, and so like with that said, 51.3% of uh, male victims reported experiencing their first victimization prior to the age of 18. This is like what I just talked about. Teenagers and children are um, extremely vulnerable. Um, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus men are at a much greater risk of sexual violence. So 40% of gay men, 47% of bisexual men and 21% of straight men. Um, so that uh, there's definitely like a difference. Um, in the statistical um, like victimization. Um, and then a national survey done in 2014 said that 4 million men had been victims of sexual violence compared to 5.6 million women. So yes, there is um, a greater number of women that are sexually assaulted, um, but the, there's a still, uh, and this is just done, this is just in America, but there is still um, an extremely large portion of males. And I think also another misconception is that even if someone is aroused, um, like if someone is aroused, then it can't be rape. Um, but the number was 800,000 of those 4 million men said that they had been coerced into penetration. Um, and so, I mean, and also, I mean, it's just, that's also like not true you can still be aroused and not consent um and then the next one is real quote unquote real rape i kind of just discussed this already can only ever be committed by strangers 
there's no difference between who perpetrates the rape, the, the rape and like the level of criminalization it is. It doesn't matter if it's a friend or your, your partner um, or a complete stranger. Rape is rape. Um, and in fact, 92% of women say that they know they're rapist. Uh, 93 for ch children and then 74% for um, males. So there is, it's, it's very uncommon um, that it's a complete stranger. And then women cry rape to get revenge or attention. This is false reporting. That's only two to 10% range. It's very rare. Um, and then the last one we've kind of right, as you already mentioned it, but rape jokes um, can be funny. Um, they just, the people who don't take them as like jokes are meant to be funny and um, the people who don't take them or just like who don't find them funny or just stuck up or like feminists or can't take a joke. Um, and the bottom line is they aren't funny. They're not a joke at all, period. Yeah, so what is consent? So um, when I asked a lot of my friends about consent, a lot of them not from my school actually didn't really know what it meant. Um, just and I just had to tell them that consent during sex is full and definite permission and agreement from all parties. Um, as said before, education is a lot of the root of a lot of the stuff that happens. Um, and people just aren't getting the correct information that they need to know. And um, basically, if you are unsure what consent is, just remember the acronym FRIES. Um, it is such as F, freely given. Uh, there should be no manipulation whatsoever involved, no drugs, no alcohol, uh, no pressure, etc. cetera, um, are reversible. Um, at any point in time, the, the parties can ask to stop and that has to be respected. I informed, um, know what you want. If your partner says that they'll use protection and they don't, that is a violation of your consent. E, enthusiastic. Um, if someone doesn't seem to be into it, uh, it's not consent. And S, specific. If it's not a definite yes, then it's a no. If it's an I guess, or if it's a if you want, then it's still a no. And basically, yeah, if there's any has, sorry, if there's any hesitation whatsoever, just rethink your actions and stop. A lot can come out of just asking a question like, um, are you ready for this? Uh, are you prepared? Uh, is this okay? And uh, like before, consent is like tea. A lot of people have already seen the video, but basically, but basically, um, you ask someone if they want tea. If they say yes, then you give them the tea, you brew the tea. Um, if they say yes and you're brewing the tea, you give them the tea, they say no, you take back the tea and you never try and force them to drink the tea. So that's a pretty simple uh, metaphor for consent. Um, so now we're gonna talk about victim blaming, um, what it looks like and what it is. So victim blaming is just blaming the victim for what happened to them. Um, it's important to remember that it's never the victim's fault and blaming them is incredibly harmful for their healing process. Um, especially if it's the initial response that the victim's getting, um, that can really dictate how they heal. And so blaming them is obviously not what you wanna do. Um, and victim blaming reinforces the idea that the abuser is right and it is the victim's fault, which is not correct. Um, sometimes, you know, people will do it to reassure themselves, especially if they know the abuser saying like, oh, you know, he or she would never do that. They're not like that. Um, and just overhearing it still has damaging effects, even if you are not the one that um, the blaming is kind of directed at, it still is harmful and it still can, um, affect your healing process as well. So some examples um, would be, you know, he or she was asking for it. Um, you shouldn't have worn that shirt of a dress. Um, you're never supposed to get that drunk. Um, 
you shouldn't have worn that, you should have covered up. Um, and a big misconception is that rape and sexual assault um, can't happen if you're dating or married to the person, which is a huge, huge misconception. It can happen to anyone at any time, no matter if you're single, married, in a relationship, um, it's still rape, no matter what. Um, okay, now we're gonna talk about what it looks like in social media um, and just rape culture overall. So I think the most common would be hateful comments um, when a survivor comes forward and shares their story, whether it be they're defending the abuser, making excuses, excuses or even just questioning the credibility. Um, and even slut shaming, that is really, really harmful. Uh, and you know, social media, when you make a comment, you don't know who's gonna read that. So um, anyone can look at your comment and really be hurt by it and it can really affect them. Also the objectification over sexualizing of women and men in the media uh, kind of goes into rape culture, um, especially with slut shaming. Um, a good example, of it would be um, on Instagram posts, you know, again, someone coming forward and sharing their story and someone saying, oh, well, what were you wearing? You know, were you drunk, blah, 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 that type of stuff. Um, another one is more recent. There was a TikTok trend where uh, survivors would come forward and uh, you would put paint on your hands and touch wherever your abuser hurt you. Um, and it was incredibly powerful. And um, obviously, you know, there was a lot of support and it was very positive, but there were also a lot of hateful comments. Um, and, you know, reading them, even though they weren't directed at me, it was still very harmful. And, you know, as a survivor, it kind of made me question whether or not I wanted to come forward and share my story and they weren't even directed at me. So that can just show you that um, on social media, it doesn't just affect that one person, it affects a whole group of people. Uh, whoever reads the comment, whoever, you know, watches that video, it can affect them. Um, so now we're going to go into rape jokes. Um, I've collected just uh, a few. Some of these are directly quoted from, um, like, uh, stand-up talk shows, stand-up um, comedians. Um, doing like a live show and then some of them are just like common phrases that I hear um, around and that every that I mean I'm sure you guys have heard a few of them um, but the first one is why are girls so afraid of rape you should uh, y'all should just feel pride that a guy risked his life in jail just to sleep with you um, if you recently had a miscarriage or been raped steer clear of my set tonight otherwise it should be a real hoot that test totally raped me if I were ever date raped, I would want to be to whole lot of love by Led Zeppelin. Man, help me in being raped over here. Are you going to molest my meal by adding that much salt? Um, so these are just a few. Uh, and then there's the meme over there in the corner. Um, anyways, these are just a few. And aside from the obvious fact that they do, they make a mockery and um, they just, they, just normalize how intense and serious sexual assault is um and they just make it seem like oh it's not a big deal and you can it's so it's so much not a big deal that you can even find it humorous um and anyways that's uh, not only is it like incredibly harmful just for the general public and the way that we view um, that we start to like, not even like aware, like we, we might not even be aware of it, but just like the way that we start to view um, sexual assault, but also um, for the survivors that, that, he, that can overhear these jokes. Um, it can cause flashbacks and um, ignite PTSD. Um, and also I think it's just in general, it's just really harmful. Um, and then I think, and, and you know, rape jokes are, are scary because usually the people telling them, if, if you try to stand up and just be like, yo, like, that's not okay, don't say that, um, 
a lot of times people come like attack you and they're like, oh, it's just a joke. Like you can't take a joke. You're such a feminist. Like it's not that big of a deal. We know rape is serious. It's just a joke. Um, and I think like those are some like, oh, whiten up. Um, but it's not like, it's not funny at all. Um, and rape jokes are incredibly harmful. Um, and so of course, like taking that initiative and stepping up and just planting the seed in their mind that maybe what they're saying isn't right um, is really impactful um, and definitely a big step in helping um, stop like rape jokes. And just to add on to that, Alana, um, in the media, uh, rape jokes are becoming more and more common as I've noticed, I don't know if anyone else has. Um, and you know, they don't even have to be like talking about rape itself, you know, joking about consent and not giving consent, that's still considered a rape joke. Um, and again, you don't know who's gonna see that on social media. So it can affect so many more people than you think. Mm -hmm. Social media has a huge impact, whether it's good or bad, so. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so next we're going to kind of adding on to rape culture, we're going to talk about toxic masculinity and um, a common phrase that's said, uh, you know, to kind of normalize um, rape culture is boys will be boys. Um, and that's really, really toxic. <laughs> um, just in a nutshell, toxic masculinity is kind of the belief that men must be dominant and they can never take no for an answer. Uh, showing emotions makes them weak. You know, they have to be tough. They have to be strong and powerful. Um, and this just add-ons to rape culture and it accepts rape and it kind of um, excuses abusers' actions and it dismisses the assaulter and it blames the victim. Um, we have two videos. One of them is a little shorter and it's Charlie Coleman talking about locker room talk specifically. And then the next one is... Um, Justin Baldoni talking about toxic masculinity and kind of how to rethink it and retrain your kids. All right, so should I just go ahead and play the videos here? Yeah. My name is Charlie Coleman and my sister was sexually assaulted by a group of guys that I thought were my friends and left to die in my yard in sub-freezing weather. They were my teammates. I ate with them at lunch. I had classes with them three or four hours a day. They were close enough to me. They know they could have called me and I would have came and got her at two in the morning or whatever time. But instead, the guys, they sat there. They kind of egged it on. They took picture and video and they let it happen. The idea of masculinity, people think that you have to dominate everything. Well, you have to dominate in the workforce. You have to dominate in the weight room, the ball field. You don't want to hear no. People that don't take no for an answer, people that succeed in life, you strive for the best all the time. You got to prove your masculinity. We see comments being made about women saying, oh, it's just locker room talk, boys will be boys. That's accepting the culture as it is and allowing it to grow. I don't think being a bystander that doesn't do anything is okay. People think that's the right thing to do because when we were growing up, everybody had heard, mind your own business. We're not taught to step in and defend somebody who can't defend themselves. Even there are situations where girls more open to their sexual life or something like that. Some people don't think twice about it because they're like, oh, well, she normally goes and sleeps around. When you categorize them, it doesn't mean that they want that just based on what they're wearing or what they've done with other people in the past. It doesn't matter who they are. They're a person. Everybody says no means no but it goes a lot deeper than that and people don't realize it if someone's quiet or doesn't flat out say yes or engage themselves in it you can't say that they're consenting because you can take the girl back to your room or go back to her room with her and if she wakes up the next day and that's not something she remembers or rem remembers consenting to or wanted then you are very much part of the problem if there's one thing in this world i think that young men need to learn to carry on through their lives is respect for another start by talking about you have to respect this person it's not about what she's wearing if a kid comes home at 13 years old and talking with his friends about oh my god did you see her butt today in social studies or the volleyball team would go on their daily run past the field and they'd be like oh my gosh those spandex kind of thing it's, it's people talk like that it's actually more disgusting than we see it as and it happens all too often because we haven't been taught 
it is up to the parents, the role models, the older brothers, the older sisters to start putting these ideas in kids' heads that this is not a thing that's okay. Okay, so here's the next one. We need balance, and the only way things will change is if we take a, a real honest look at the scripts that have been passed down to us from generation to generation, and the roles that, as men, we choose to take on in our everyday lives. And for as long as I can remember, I've been told the kind of man that I should grow up to be. As a boy, all I wanted was to be accepted and liked by the other boys. But that acceptance meant I had to acquire this almost disgusted view of the feminine. And since we were told that feminine is the opposite of masculine, I either had to reject embodying any of these qualities or face rejection myself. This is the script that we've been given, right? Girls are weak and boys are strong. This is what's being subconsciously communicated to hundreds of millions of young boys and girls all over the world just like it was with me. Well, I came here today to say, as a man, that this is wrong, this is toxic, and it has to end. But I'm just a guy that woke up after 30 years and realized that I was living in a state of conflict. Conflict with who I feel I am in my core, and conflict with who the world tells me as a man I should be. But I don't have a desire to fit into the current broken definition of masculinity. Because I don't just want to be a good man. I want to be a good human. And I believe the only way that can happen is if men learn to not only embrace the qualities that we were told are feminine in ourselves, but to be willing to stand up, to champion, and learn from the women who embody them. I am not saying that everything we've learned is toxic, okay? I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with you or me. And men, I'm not saying we have to stop being men. But we need balance, right? We need balance. And the only way things will change is if we take a, a real honest look at the scripts that have been passed down to us from generation to generation and the roles that, as men, we choose to take on in our everyday lives. So speaking of scripts, the first script I ever got came I'm from my dad. Home. My dad is this awesome. Is sexually assaulted by he's dad, loving, he's kind, he's sensitive. He's nurturing, but sorry, dad, as a kid, I resented him for it because I blamed him for making me soft, which wasn't welcomed in the small town in Oregon that we had moved to because being soft meant that I was bullied. See, my dad wasn't traditionally masculine, so he didn't teach me how to use my hands. He didn't teach me how to hunt, how to fight, man stuff. Instead, he taught me what he knew. That being a man was about sacrifice and doing whatever you can to take care of and provide for your family. But there was another role I learned how to play from my dad, who I discovered learned it from his dad, a state senator who later in life had to work nights as a janitor to support his family. And he never told a soul. That role was to suffer in secret. And now three generations later, I find myself playing that role too. So why couldn't my grandfather just reach out to another man and ask for help? Why does my dad to this day still think he's got to do it all on his own? I know men who would rather die than tell another man that they're hurting. But it's not because we're just all like, strong, silent types. It's not. A lot of us men are really good at making friends and talking. Just not about anything real. It's about work sports, or politics, or women, we have no problem sharing our opinions. But if it's about our insecurities, or our struggles, our fear of failure, then it's almost like we become paralyzed. At least, I do. So some of the ways that I've been practicing breaking free of this behavior are by creating experiences that force me to be vulnerable. So if there's something I'm experiencing shame around in my life, I practice diving straight into it, no matter how scary it is, and sometimes even publicly. Because then in doing so, I take away its power, and my display of vulnerability can 
in some cases, give other men permission to do the same. As an example, uh, a little while ago, I was wrestling with an issue in my life that I knew I needed to talk to my guy friends about. But I was so paralyzed by fear that they would judge me and see me as weak and I would lose my standing as a leader that I knew I had to take them out of town on a three-day guys trip just to open up. And guess what? It wasn't until the end of the third day that I finally found the strength to talk to them about what I was going through. And when I did, something amazing happened. I realized that I wasn't alone because my guys had also been struggling. And as soon as I found the strength and the courage to share my shame, it was gone. Growing up, we tend to challenge each other. We got to be the toughest, the strongest, the bravest men that we can be. And for many of us, myself included, our identities are wrapped up in whether or not at the end of the day, we feel like we're man enough. But I got a challenge for all the guys because men love challenges. I challenge you to see if you can use the same qualities that you feel make you a man to go deeper into yourself, your strength, your bravery, your toughness. Can we redefine what those mean and use them to explore our hearts? Are you brave enough to be vulnerable? To reach out to another man when you need help? To dive headfirst into your shame? Are you strong enough to be sensitive? To cry whether you are hurting or you're happy, even if it makes you look weak? Are you confident enough to listen to the women in your life, to hear their ideas and their solutions, to hold their anguish and actually believe them, even if what they're saying is against you? And will you be man enough to stand up to other men when you hear locker room talk, when you hear stories of sexual harassment, when you hear your boys talking about grabbing ass or getting her drunk, will you actually stand up and do something so that one day we don't have to live in a world where a woman has to risk everything and come forward to say the words, me too? All right, there we go. We need balance. Uh, oh my God, okay. So here, we're gonna move on. Um, so those are both really powerful. Um, obviously these two, uh, men are very educated and they have, um, very strong opinions, um, about toxic masculinity and truly they're, it's amazing. So, um, even if you are a woman, I think taking toxic masculinity into account is very important. So, uh, let's move on. Okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to kind of change gears and talk about sex education and why it's important that we change it and kind of how the current or mostly current way it's being taught uh, adds to rape culture. Um, so proper sex education is important for a number of different reasons. Uh, learning about consent and how to be an active bystander and how to have safe sex uh, can help young people and anyone really, um, make important and safe decisions when it comes to sex and the relationships that they wanna be in. Um, these decisions are obviously important as they can have a serious effect on one's health and just overall well-being um, that can honestly be lifelong. And it's important to have a full understanding of what consent and safe sex is before you get into a relationship or become sexually active. Um, a common or more common um, kind of down in the South, uh, a way of teaching sex is abstinence only. Um, and it's pretty outdated. And, um, you know, as you can see on this graph, this kind of shows us um, the ones in the gray have no sex education or very little and the ones in the pink have some. Um, so obviously that's an alarming number that not many states have sex education or proper. Um, and that's super harmful and kind of goes into rape culture because these kids aren't learning about consent or how to be an active bystander or what a healthy relationship even looks like. Um, states such as Arkansas and Mississippi have little to no sex education, um, yet they have some of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the country. 
So that shows you that telling kids, hey, don't have sex, that's not actually productive and it does the opposite. Uh, yeah, and like just chiming in, there's a lot of different factors that go into why sex education isn't taught in certain areas. Um, for example, I'm in California and, uh, and I'm in a private school. So sex education uh, has been um, mandated from sixth grade through high school. And I think that that's the way it should be. Um, but sadly, a lot of schools don't have enough funding for that. And even though it is a very important topic, a lot of schools just don't have the proper education and teachers and environment to teach those kinds of things. And as well as that, um, aligning with a previous statistic, um, there's also no uh, queer representation in a lot of schools. And that also contributes to a lot of stuff that happens. Okay, I'm gonna read something in the chat because someone said something. Um, I knew nothing about sexual education at all growing up, had no idea about ovulation, even after I got pregnant with my son at age 23, and I'm still learning to this day. So that um, I can kind of relate to. Um, I was never taught sex education properly. Um, I'm a junior in high school, and um, at my school, health is required just for one year, your sophomore year, um, and it's just half a year. Um, so I had health my, the spring of my um, sophomore year, which was when COVID hit. So I didn't really have a sex education at all. I didn't really have a health class. Um, I don't even think the word sex was brought up at all. And in middle school, um, it was not LGBTQ plus inclusive. It um, wasn't even like woman friendly. We didn't talk about ovulation, we didn't even talk about periods, we didn't um, even learn about the female anatomy, we learned about the male anatomy, and that was it. I was taught growing up um, for my schools that, you know, sex is between a man and woman when they want to have a kid, and that's it, and um, obviously that's not the case everywhere, but for me, you know, I went to high school, and I had no idea, I didn't know anything, and then I'm still in high school and I haven't been taught any of it. So I've had to kind of teach myself and, you know, ask my parents, ask my friends. And obviously, you know, that's fine. But it's important that overall kids have an understanding of consent and sex and even just like what is going on in their bodies. All right. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, rape portrayal in shows and uh, media in general. So first up is this show called 13 Reasons Why. Um, a lot of teens probably know this show because of how controversial it was. And um, we think that it has a poor portrayal of sexual assault. Um, first off, uh, sexual assault in 13 Reasons Why is taken up really, really insensitively. Um, just start starting with the fact that it's really graphic and unsettling. Um, there's no time spent on any of the victim's stories or the aftermath or their, or how they heal. And it doesn't really do anything except add a little shock value. And um, rather than genuinely try to inform watchers about sexual assault, um, the show is um, a lot more plot driven and it focuses more on the revenge of the victim and the revenge of the, I'm uh, sorry, and the redemption of the assaulter, um, which is absolutely horrible. It's uh, really ridiculous, um, but it does show that many people do get away with rape, especially rich and well-respected white men. And um, they have a kind of savior mindset with the show that as long as they include the problems in the show, they're making the world better, which is um, simply incorrect. And the only credit that could be given is that they do shine a light on the fact that uh, male rape victims are present and that they're just as important as female victims. And then after that is uh, unbelievable. It was a it was a limited series on Netflix and it actually had a really, really good portrayal of sexual assault. And it was really honest and pointed out a lot of flaws in our system. So 
um, as I said, it points out a lot of faults in our legal system by utilizing a male detective who pushes the first victim, Marie, who is a real person, um, to constantly relive and retell her story and ultimately make her question her credibility and mental health. Um, the detective really makes Marie feel incredibly unsafe and scared. And this leads to her lying about her experience and retracting her statement. And um, it even leads her to have suicidal thoughts. Um, in a different state, uh, another woman named Amber is raped, but the, but the situation is handled a lot more sensitively um, with a female detective on the case. Uh, she never doubts uh, the story and constantly consoles her. And throughout the series, we follow Marie and her journey and just battling with her PTSD. And I think that's a really important part of this show that we get to see what the victims go through. Uh, she pushes people, she can't properly work at her job. And as I said before, she even eventually becomes suicidal. And um, the show really draws comparisons between Amber and Marie and uh, maybe that if all victims were treated with the care that Amber had been treated with, that a lot of things probably would have been different. So it's, I think this show is absolutely amazing. And it truly is, um, when it, this show just is probably, it probably handled um, rape the best out of any show I've ever seen. So next we're gonna talk about 365 days. This is a touchy subject for me because it makes me very mad. Um, but it was basically, it was this movie that came out in 2020. Um, and it just, it's about this mafia guy um, who like dreams about this woman and then he sees her and he kidnaps her and he gives her a hundred days to fall in love with him. And if she doesn't, he'll let her go unscathed. Um, and then of course, you know, at the end she, okay, not to spoil it, but, um, at the end she falls in love with him. Um, but I mean, throughout the movie, there's just like extraordinary examples of why media contributes so much to the way that sexual harassment and sexual assault is viewed because there is, I mean, there is definitely some negative feedback, but throughout social media and throughout every almost every single like female who I knew in my life they were in love with the main character the the kidnapper and I mean he was like the movie was so romanticized and it's just that influence that is so important um and so impactful in the way that rape culture and in like in rape culture and so I just like I just chose a few quotes um, but like one of the very first lines is just like this, the dad talking to um, the kidnapper guy. Um, and he was just, he's just saying like, beautiful women are heaven for the eyes, hell for the soul and purgatory for the wallet. So right off the bat, we're objectifying them. Um, and, and then of course, the next, the next thing, um, we've got some nice strong gender roles where we have the rude and disrespectful boyfriend who's telling the girl who ends up getting kidnapped, sorry, I hope you're like following along here. Um, but this like the boyfriend, he's like, oh, besides you probably haven't packed for us yet. So assuming that she's gonna pack for both of them. And she ends up, you know, breaking up with him because he's rude and says things like this, which is yes, you know, very impactful. But the alternative is just so much better because he, the alternative is the man who kidnaps um, the woman, um, Laura. And um, he basically, he just tells her um, not to pr pr provoke him, even though she'd been drugged and um, kidnapped and like tied and gagged. Um, uh, and oh, anyways, he just said not to provoke him because he's not used to being gentle. Um, and then she tries to escape, she, she like falls off a boat or something and he, and he says, I'm so glad you're alive, but at the same time, I want to kill you. And there's so many more, I, I couldn't, like, I couldn't find, um, I wasn't going to go through the whole movie and like pick out a bunch of quotes, but it's just like, 
movies like this and just films and the way that it ripples across social media because it's so fast it's instantaneous and I mean it's just so dangerous um and and such a huge contributor and same you know with 13 reasons why um but I think just movies that make it seem hot and attractive that this guy is like willing to do all of this and then and then of course you know she ends up falling in love with him so there's that aspect um which is just oh anyways three and six five days is a really big big one and it also um I don't know about 13 Reasons Why, but 365 Days, it also kind of feeds into the toxic masculinity, um, especially with, like, the comments about girls. Um, So that's also a big problem with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I went, like, after it came out, it went instantly viral. So just the impact was huge. And a lot of people weren't even focusing on how gross of a movie it is. They were focusing on just funny lines that were delivered weird so yeah yeah and there was sexual assault like he you know like he was like choking her and then anyway and and then he drugged her and and, like made out with her and it was just oh and she and then she like hits him as well and then he like bruises her and oh it goes on and on and on but yeah next up Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about Bridgerton, which just recently came out, like a couple months ago, I think, on Netflix. Um, And for those of you who haven't watched it, it's set in, like, England in the 1800s. Um, And the main character, Daphne, the redhead right there, um, is basically not taught about sex education at all. She doesn't even know how babies are made, doesn't know what consent is. And back then, you know, they were kind of women were forced into marriage. So um, she was forced into marriage. She didn't know anything about sex, didn't know how babies were made, nothing about consent or just overall sexual health. And she actually ended up raping her husband at the time um, because she wanted to get pregnant. And he told her that he uh, couldn't have kids, not that he didn't want kids. Um, And so this was a huge problem. Uh, The scene was very brief, but disturbing. Um, And it wasn't even treated as rape, which is super problematic, especially because the victim was a male um, and a person of color, which just statistically, um, you know, men are often more silenced and, you know, again, with the whole toxic masculinity being weak. Um, So, yeah, that was a huge problem. And just overall, there was no consent, no sex education in the show. And just also women were very objectified and sexualized too. Okay. So here's just a list of some of the good and bad shows. Um, Unbelievable, Rectify, which is another show that um, just depicts the trauma and PTSD of a male victim. Um, One called Sex Education, season two. Specifically, um, there's just a great moment between a lot of women and the society uh, which has good representation of domestic violence and abusive relationship, and then the bad ones, which we just talked about. So, And obviously this doesn't imply that the shows on the right are bad, um, just simply that they don't really have great portrayals of harassment. Doesn't mean they aren't bad though, but you know, okay. Um, all right, so we're gonna skip the questions because we don't have any more time, but um, if you guys wanna, uh, just ask us questions through our social media. Um, Ali and Izzy, me, we have social media. We have Instagram. So you can go ahead and go on there and ask us anything you're wondering about. Or I mean, left too, if anybody wants to jump in with questions. Yeah, yeah you can like type it in the chat. Um, Izzy, do you want to go back to that slide with just like the questions that we thought of? I will say too, um, one of the um, depictions that I really did like this year as well was, um, I think it came out in 2020 was Normal People. I think it was on Amazon. Again, they did a really good job of um, depicting consent. Um, And, um, you know, again, a really complex relationship, but still a really important depiction of a positive experience with consent and a really positive way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, 
We need a few yeah. more of those every single time. Um, you know, these shows, at, as well as 13 Reasons Why does, even that was problematic in, um, you know, in its depiction. They've stumbled through it, um, not really, you know, uh, taking the opportunity to explore um, and really truly understand that consent is both something that men and women need. So, you know, they really missed the mark in that, in that one scene. And they were just going along so gangbusters, just great job. And then it was like, Mark. So, yeah. um, <laughs> Hill from, I don't know, like three episodes in, yeah. I, just, I can't deal with that show, but yeah. It's tricky. It's tricky. I think, you know, again, the people who are producing these shows are, older people and they have absolutely no education whatsoever in consent so their depiction of it is problematic and and you know we should probably just create an entire committee of young people to help influence the programming that's coming around about this because what's interesting is it's all targeting young people but it's missing the mark in a lot of ways so mm -hmm. young people are, go are pointing out all the flaws in the way that older people are producing content for young people it's really full circle but I um one one question and i may have missed it in the beginning did did you guys touch on i may destroy you or have you no. seen that no. um <clears throat> i do want to give a trigger warning for that uh film or not film but it is on hbo and it is all it covers mental health it covers sexual assault from the perspective of um a, care, a woman of color um mm -hmm in London. So it's kind of like this internet, it covers the experience of coming out and being LGBTQ. Now, one thing I would like to say is HBO did a really outstanding job because along with the film, with every episode um, that was released, they released resources and um, lesson plans and, and um, conversation starters, as well as resources for people to get help. But I would like to say anybody that's thinking about watching that, um, as um, somebody who identifies as um, a, a thriver, not a survivor, it was incredibly triggering for me. And I actually have not made it through the whole entire um, uh, series, but it kind of tackles addiction and the connections between assault and PTSD and addiction. Um, and the name of that is called I May Destroy You. Um, and it's, it's a yeah, it's set in British and it really looks at a predominantly black British cast, but it is power, power, powerhouse. Um, and it's Michelle Cole or Mi yeah, Michelle A. Cole. It's really good. I just want to, I may destroy you is what it's called. It's really, really, really good. Yeah. And adding on to what Michelle just said about um, like trigger content, um, a lot of the shows that I've watched, like Bridgerton and stuff like that, they have no trigger warning about the content. So like, I had no idea that there was going to be a rape scene. And all of a sudden I was just watching it. You know, and, right. and so many, I was like, I didn't even, I didn't even know, like, I remember I had to like pause the TV and ask myself, what the hell did I just watch? Yeah. You know, you know what I think is really interesting about that is because, um, as a society, we don't have enough conversations about the experience of men being assaulted. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that the film Purdue, I have a, I just feel like they didn't even think of it as being something that needed to have a yeah. trigger warning. However, well, I think the whole th series needs one. That's so common though. I call it the 13 reasons why effect, right? Who's high school um, put out some sort of letter to their entire student body and parents after 13 Reasons Why came out, right? And what did the letter say? Did it say anything about sexual violence? No, none of them did. 0% of school administrators sent out a letter that said anything about sexual violence. They talked about sexual, uh, they talked about uh, um, suicide, right? They didn't talk about the underlying reasons that she attempted or, or um, was had suicidal ideation, but, um, so, you know, I really think that um, one of the things we've been really, you know, pressing really hard for is that these, so many of these films and television series are targeting young people, right? The issues, the, the, um, the leads in the show are all young people and they're targeting young people, but they're not putting out trigger warnings, content, learning resources, talking points so that there isn't this um, horrific, just like Ellie said, like I put, I hit pause and went, what did I just watch? There should be 
resources. I think one of the things that I really keep saying to every filmmaker I talk to is you have a moral obligation when you are putting out films or series of this kind to create resources and or direct kids toward resources when they're watching these films. You're not putting out the matrix here. It's not some you know action film and everybody's just on for the ride. You are putting out content that needs a trigger warning and that needs resources attached to it. Otherwise, 13 Reasons Why Effect, you're gonna see people scrambling mm -hmm. to respond to the content you've just put out. And nobody, nobody wants to put out, I, you know, I certainly think that no filmmakers wanna put out irresponsible content or irrespons um, have irresponsible reactions to their content. However, you know, I really do think that, you know, the more I talk to, you know, more and more people in the industry is to say, there is a level of responsibility in that. You want to put out that content, you have a responsibility to do it ethically. I think, yeah, and oh, go ahead, Allie. Um, I was just going to say, like, social media has become a huge part of our lives. And, you know, what we watch and what we see, especially young kids who are still growing and developing, that can really affect someone. And, I mean, I've never seen 13 Reasons Why. Um, but all, all I knew about it was that, you know, it talked about suicide and self-harm and it was really triggering for those um, who have had suicidal thoughts. And I didn't even know it talked about sexual harassment or rape until I actually started working on this with Izzy. And she was like, hey, let's talk about 13 Reasons Why. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I didn't want to watch 13 Reasons Why because it talked about suicide, but I didn't know anything about the whole sexual harassment part. And so that's a I think we're going to see more of this content. You know, we're starting yeah. to see, I don't know if anybody's, uh, you know, ventured out to see um, Promising Young Woman. Yeah. It's an extraordinary film. However, the second I saw it, and I went out to see it in movie theaters because I heard about it prior to it even going to Sundance, and I knew it would get huge pickup, was they have a huge responsibility. Again, young targeted audience, you know, depicting sexual violence in college, and they put out absolutely no trigger warning and absolutely no resources connected mm -hmm. to it. Does it is it a phenomenal film and an interesting, uh, you know, commentary on our society as we exist today? Absolutely. Does it need that? Without question. But you know, we haven't quite bridged that gap between activism and and art, which again is so much of what we're about at Safe Bay, right? Obviously, our founding came from Audrey and Daisy as a film itself, but so much of that there's a just a, still a huge gap in art and activism and art showing us and opening us up to things that we may not have experienced but helping us understand and and depict important stories but still connecting it to activism connecting it to resources I think is a huge responsibility Absolutely. but you know Again, I'm on my soapbox all the time with filmmakers who are asking for, you know, consultations from us or, or questions for us. I'm like, do not put that film out without <laughs> content. Uh, so I'm like looking at the chat and um, let's see, someone says there should be trigger warnings and shows through sexual coercion, um, yet there is none because so many people are uneducated regarding sexual coercion. I had no idea I was being sexually assaulted for years because of how normalized it is. So that is a really, really good point, especially going back to how social media plays a big role in our life. You know, if we're all watching these shows um, that have sexual assault and sexual harassment and there's no trigger warning and, you know, the filmmakers aren't saying, hey, this is wrong or, you know, this is not how a healthy relationship is supposed to look like, that just normalizes it even more. Right. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, the media, like the film industry or the television industry is singularly responsible for educating yeah. our entire culture. However, but it plays a in, role. you know, proper consent education, as you all yeah. talked about, um, you know, there is a huge opportunity within the film industry, mm -hmm. to, particularly since, you know, the, the Me Too movement was birthed, um, you know, within that industry, the whole conversation was birthed within that industry. They have an opportunity to step up and really lead um, educational discussions around this. I mean, I do think it's a missed opportunity if, if it's not one that some, you know, that, that people are taking, but, you know, we need to do both, right? We need to step up our game and consent and, and sex education in schools and what 
uh, what is called um, comprehensive sex education. And, um, and certainly there is an opportunity within media to do the same. Every mm-hmm. opportunity we can get, right? Like everywhere we can be to talk about these things. And I mean, this is just like my personal opinion. Um, but I think, you know, the more we have proper sex education, the more, um, you know, we're taught about toxic relationships, what actually a healthy relationship is like, um, the signs of, you know, a potential domestic violence situation, um, you know, we can use that to then call out people in the media who aren't doing a good job either portraying it, aren't putting trigger warnings, um, or, you know, again, just making rape jokes, victim blaming. The more we know about consent, the more we know about um, proper sex education that's LGBTQ plus inclusive, the more we can change and the more we can kind of call out those people on social media or, you know, just people we're having conversations in their day-to-day lives. And that's really where it's going to start. Um, that kind of ripple effect of change is the more we know and the more we educate ourselves and others, you know, hopefully one day we'll live in a world where there will be trigger warnings and, you know, people won't be victim shaming online. But until then, we got to hold everyone accountable. Yeah, keep but um, it's 401. So we should probably wrap up. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Oh, but yeah. All right. Um, well, thanks to people for coming. Thank you, so Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. You all, you know, to Ali's point, there will be a future where this isn't something that is so, you know, foreign to our day-to-day lives. And you all are the beginning of the end of the secrecy and shame and, you know, really poor job we've done of educating people. So thank you so much. And With that, we're wrapping up our summit for 2021. And I am so grateful to all of you. You all did such an amazing job. I cannot believe what incredible conversations everyone has had. And um, we'll be putting everything we can on our YouTube in the next um, 24 hours or so, just letting everything buffer and upload. And um, thank you all so much. I really can't um, appreciate you all enough for everybody who's contributed. Thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much.